Good morning. Good morning. Um, I, I want to thank Omega Rho uh, for giving me this honor. It's a great pleasure to be giving uh, the Omega Rho lecture. Um, and what I'm going to talk about is um, a little bit of sort of via culpa stuff. Um, you know, kind of looking back at some of the things that have happened in recent crises, um, what went wrong? Uh, was, it, was there something that we should have done? Something that we as educators, for example, uh, should have done, or we as practitioners um, should have done? Uh, and and why, why did these things happen? What, what, what is it that possibly might have led to them? And are there ways that we can improve on what we do so that perhaps some of these crises might be avoided or maybe they might be dealt with better um, in the future? Okay, so that's, that's sort of the background. Um, First, I want, I want to start with kind of where I came from in looking at this. And, and when, I, when I started thinking about some of these risk management failures, I went back to some of the things that I had done in the past and then thought about, well, you know, maybe, maybe I actually had some lessons that I should have picked up somewhat earlier. And I'll talk about two things. Um, the first was probably this was really the first thing that I did. This was 30 years ago. Um, as kind of practicing OR um, was uh, doing and trying, putting together an MBA schedule um, with uh, for the National Basketball Association with Jim Bean. Um, and this was while we were graduate students and we were just looking at what was happening to our team at the time, which was Golden State Warriors, and um, seeing them just go back and forth across the country and, and just be sort of sped all, all over the place. Um, without some sort of rhyme or reason and thinking, you know, there should be a better way. We can use our skills to, to create a better schedule. And we put together this schedule that decreased uh, travel distance by about 20%. And I thought, that's, that's fantastic. You know, 20% decrease in, in uh, schedule in travel um, just through the schedule and, and all the savings that would go to the teams. Um, I thought, this was, this was wonderful. And um, we've been talking with the, the league, the league seemed very excited about it, the league was ready to, to use, a, use our schedule, um, um, but then they went with someone else. And I thought, well, we, hey, you know, we, we have the best solution, you know, we, we minimized the, the travel schedule, we, we got it, well, maybe not minimum, but anyway, it's a lot better than theirs. Um, so what, why did they take this, why did they pick someone else? Um, well, I didn't think about it. What was the league's objective? The league's objective was, I want to keep my good teams happy, and I want to make as little hassle for myself as possible. Keep my good teams happy, I can do that in lots of different ways. And especially if I have somebody that I can control, it's like across the street, which they ended up, nearby, which they ended up using. Um, so I didn't think about what their objective was. Their objective had nothing to do with travel. That was something for the players, maybe for the owners, but for the league, that was not the main thing. The league's main thing was, I got to keep those teams that, teams like Boston Celtics, uh, the LA Lakers, I got to keep them happy. The rest of the team, I don't care about. The fact that you say, at the time, when San Antonio was uh, traveling five times as much as, um, say, Boston, um, the fact that you say San Antonio a lot, that doesn't do me much good. Um, so I didn't think about it. Okay, so I thought, so I learned this lesson, right? Um, another problem, almost at the same time after I started in Michigan, um, of course this was after the 1980 census, so everybody was redistricting, which everybody will be doing, and I encourage you to get involved with redistricting in your states, um, especially since a lot of your state legislatures have changed color, um, in, uh, or will change color starting in January. Um, and uh, that is going to make a difference, believe me, that's going to make a difference uh, in how districts are formed. Um, and so, Michigan State um, Supreme Court was well aware of that, uh, well aware that there would be partisan bickering in, term, in terms of creating uh, districts uh, for the state of Michigan. Um, and therefore, the state actually declared an optimization model for the creation of districts. That is, that the districts of the state will be created in such a way as to minimize the number of political boundaries which are broken, starting with county boundaries and then proceeding to municipal boundaries um, uh, 
proceeding. Start with counter boundaries, then going to the municipal boundaries. And the number of boundaries that the uh, redistricting plan, which has the fewest number of boundaries broken, will be the redistricting, redistricting plan, which we will choose. Okay, so but great, this is another optimization problem. One of the uh, parties won't mention which, uh, one of the parties came to me and said, uh, do you think you could help us? I said, sure, I can try to solve this, this optimization model. Um, and I came up with a plan that only broke four county lines in terms of uh, creating uh, districts for the Michigan State Senate. Uh, so this was just four county lines, and I could actually show that you, there was no way you could do it with three. Um, and there might have been a couple ways you could do it with four, but you could certainly do no better than four. You could not do it with three, band, with three counties. Um, and so I thought, this is great. It satisfied it uh, for my client. Uh, my client was very happy about it because this happened to be very good for, for their party. Um, and uh, I thought, that's great. Okay, this is what they're going to do. They're going to use this. Well, the other party came up with something with five county lines broken, right? Violating the order of the state Supreme Court. Um, they both go to the state Supreme Court, one with five, one with four, and the law of the land is supposed to be we will take the one that breaks the fewest number of county lines. And the state Supreme Court said, well, you know, four, five, they're kind of about the same. I kind of like the one with five. Uh, um, now you can guess, five out of the nine members on the state Supreme Court voted for the one with five. Four out of members of the state Supreme Court voted for the one with four. And you can kind of figure out which side of the line the five or the vote for the five kind of lines, which were the four. Um, so even when people state what their objective is, that's not their objective. The, the Supreme Court stated what their objective was, but that wasn't it. Their objective was, we want to make sure that our party stays in power because uh, they're the ones that are going to make sure that we stay appointed. Um, so I, I, again, I didn't figure out that list. So you have to know who makes the decisions and what her or his objective is going to be, or what their objective is going to be. Um, and I think that's a lesson that, you know, the more, the more you think about it, you really have to remember it as we design models, as we try to implement them, as we try to influence the way people make decisions, um, we have to think about what, what really is their, is their objective. Okay, well, that's sort of a very long way of skipping start. I'm going to talk about these three events. Um, and there are two, there's sort of two, well, there are two types of lessons in risk aversion. Um, one is, uh, well, you didn't really manage your risk well. And the other is, that is, you didn't control them or didn't mitigate them well enough. And the other is that you might have overmanaged them, that you might have put in too many controls and lost a lot of money doing it. Um, and maybe that was also a mistake. Um, so I'll talk about um, the financial crisis, which is still going, about the Deepwater Horizon. Um, oil rig spill, um, and about the uh, volcanic eruption in Iceland. Um, now, in each of these cases, you, if you look at it from the way I think most of us sort of set problems up, um, where you think about the organization as making the decision, and everything's going to be best for the organization, you know, we're, maybe we're not quite so naive that we think it's best for society, but at least it ought to be best for the people that, you know, what we think of as the client, are the, the, is the organization as opposed to maybe the individual who actually en ends up being able to implement things. Um, but but in, in each of these cases, I think that's, that's sort of where, where you might um, think that OR fail, or risk management fail. Um, and in each case, these are pretty sophisticated organizations. Um, organizations like some of the biggest companies in the world in terms of the financial crisis, another one of the biggest companies in the world. Um, in terms of the oil spill, um, and uh, well, one of the biggest regions in the world um, in terms of this uh, volcanic eruption. Um, so, what, what happened? Well, then, uh, what I'll do is I'll go through each of these um, and kind of first, first sort of do the, my, the way I would have looked at it straight off, um, and then try to think, well, wait a second, but that's not what happened, so maybe there's a different way to look at it, look at it from that different perspective, and then try to pull things back together and say, all right, so how does, this, how does this impact how we should view problems? And what kind of problems then should we be looking at um, as we consider trying to correct some of these mistakes that possibly were made in the past? 
Okay, so let's, let's, we'll start with the financial crisis. Um, well, on each of these, there's plenty to complain. Um, I think, uh, you know, I'll say it, I'm, I'm guilty. We're all guilty. Um, we certainly did something wrong. Um, uh, but I think a lot of it's just by viewing the decisions from the wrong perspective. Um, I think we can improve the value of our models if we recognize, we have to recognize this decision maker's self interest, just like the Supreme Court, like the Commissioner of the NBA. Um, we have to recognize what their self interest is um, and design our policies to be consistent um, with incentives that promote their own self interest because that's the only way things are going to get done. Um, okay, so let's look at the uh, financial crisis. Um, here's the Dow Jones uh, Industrial Average, and I put down uh, two 17 month periods. One is 1929 through 1931, and the other is uh, 2007 through 2009. And uh, we know that 29 was pretty bad. Um, so, how bad was the recent crisis? Can you tell? You can't tell which one it is, right? I mean, look at, look at it. It looks pretty bad. It's like, like the Great Depression. Um, the one on the left is from the Great Depression. Actually, I would have guessed the other way. I would have guessed, uh, oh no, the one that looks a little bit steeper. That must have been uh, the Great Depression, not, not the recent crisis. No, the one on the right there, that's, that's the recent crisis. Um, that was a drop in value of the Dow of over half of its value, over 50%, 52%. Um, the only loss that came anywhere close to that in the same period of about a year and a half um, was um, in that period in the 70s, and that was the down went down by a third. Um, the very worst that actually happened a little bit later in the Great Depression, so I didn't show you the absolute worst of the Great Depression. But I showed you what everyone thinks about it. Everyone thinks about the 29 period um, as being the start of the Great Depression and how everything collapsed. So this was a pretty bad problem. This, I mean, this, was a, this looks like a magnificent failure of all the things we try to do. And uh, this just illustrates it was all, all across the board. Um, at the top left there, those are that's that's how much money people actually have. Um, the, the, the top right, well, top left are financial assets. The top right are all of their of their worth. Um, the bottom left are corporate corporate equities got hit really hard, and then real estate, which continues to be hammered, um, as many of you tried to sell a house recently uh, have discovered. Um, so it was, it was all over the place. Now I'm not going to look at everything. I'm just going to look at one organization, which is extremely sophisticated. Um, many, some of you may, might work there. Uh, my apologies. I don't mean to single you out, um, and I don't mean to. And I'm, I'm going to try really hard not to mention any people's name names as I go through this. Um, but um, well, I'll talk about AIG. Okay, AIG, very sophisticated. Triple A rated company. How many triple A? There were like three. GE, AIG, and one other that I can't remember. Um, were the highest rated. That should be the best companies in the world. How did this happen? Okay, AIG, this is true. They, they became too big to fail. Government basically took them over, um, but didn't let them fail. Um, their losses and the connections that they had across the economy really brought them. Brought about to some extent all this class. Certainly, Lehman's failing had a lot to do with it, but, but AIG was, was a major player in this. And then they're an insurer. They're in the insurance business. And they didn't have risk management? Wait, I thought that's their business. This is, this, you know, how, how can this possibly be? Um, we'll start. Yeah. All right, here's a, just to show you how bad uh, AIG got hit. Here there we can say that it's a sort of uh, copy this from someone's paper, um, but on the right it's 2005. It goes over to just until the government took them over. All right, so they're making lots of money. Fifteen billion dollars in 2005. $22 billion dollars in 2006. Okay, started to have some problem in the real estate market in 2007 um, in terms of subprime. Um, only nine billion dollars. All right, and then up until the time the government bails them out, they've lost. Fifty billion dollars. Pretty amazing, you know how how a company that's in this business that actually should know everything about it and should have all the training. And I know there are some of them who have training from schools that I've been to. Um, <laughs> um, they have they, they should have they should have been able to practice. 
goes to 1 in 1,000. It goes from AAA to A. Or, yeah. Uh, so basically, 10 times more likely to default. Okay, 10 times more likely to default. Oh, now you have to come up with 10 times as much collateral. And that's basically when it started happening. All these, this 1 out of 10 event, which they might have even forecast. There's nothing to say that they didn't forecast this 1 out of 10 event that the real estate market was going to go south. So shouldn't they have been aware that, that that's going to trigger all these collateral calls, and they're going to have to come up with less collateral, they're going to have to sell stuff, and if that's happening while they're trying to sell stuff, other people are going to try to sell stuff, everybody's going to be dumping, there aren't going to be any buyers, and prices are going to collapse. Um, so this collateral requirement seems to have brought about the ruin. Maybe they just weren't aware of it, but, but it seems like these were things that, that could have been sort of forecast, and it's not that unusual. It's not like this is a 1 in 10,000 thing that happened. This is only maybe a 1 in 10 thing that happened. Um, so, so if they knew this, if they, you know, they're in, in the insurance business and they know that one in, one in ten events might happen, why is it that they had still ended up selling CDSs? Were they just, were they somehow, these insurers who were very sophisticated, somehow unaware of what they were doing? Um, well, if we look at it, uh, I'll just use really simple decision trees and sort of look at this. If we look at it from the perspective of the way we, if we would normally, thinking about it from the point of view of, say, AIG shareholders who are supposed to be responsible here, um, and we start off at the point where AIG say we're trading at $100 a share, which it was one time, um, and we think about, well, you know, should we, should we keep on selling these CDSs, or should we hold off? Should we not sell anymore? Um, and if we keep on selling them, there's this 1 in 10,000 10, chance that basically we go bust, um, and either we just go bankrupt, or the government comes in and bails us out, but either way, our shareholders are probably going to be wiped out. Um, so we're going to lose everything, but that's like, you know, 1 in 10. Um, but that's pretty bad. Um, maybe there's a 90% chance we sell more and we actually make more money, like the share goes up by 20%. And maybe if we just hold it off, maybe the share goes up by a normal amount. Okay, if we do this standard kind of uh, analysis, we'll say, gosh, you know, it's, it looks like a pretty, pretty bad deal um, to issue more shares. That only has like an expected value of, let's say, $8 billion or $8 a share. Um, if, we, if we hold off the, on the CDSs, that has a value of $10, 10 a share. So let, let's go with just holding on. You know, if we look at it from the, from the organization perspective, when we normally look at these problems, we would say, yeah, they should have held off. There must have been something wrong. They must have, done, they must have not assessed these probabilities correctly. They must, have, they must have not known about what might happen if they had to come up with more collateral. They must have been unaware of what was going on. So maybe just giving them more information, maybe that's going to help. Or maybe coming up with different ways in which people uh, categorize collateral, maybe that will help. Um, but I don't think so. I don't think so in this case. Um, I think what, what happens in this case is, is we have to look at who's making these decisions. Who was selling these shares? Right? Who are the ones who are out there selling? Okay, there were traders. Traders selling these shares. They had bonus compensation. Uh, bonus compensation tied to how many of these things they sold. So they kept on selling them. Now, from the firm perspective, uh, maybe from the shareholder perspective, maybe that wasn't great, but these are bonuses. These are like options. They only have upside. So for the traders, there's only upside. That's all I see. Um, so relatively small movements in the shares actually mean a lot to these people. And it could mean a lot to the CEO. Maybe I won't bring, it, bring all this down to the CEO. Um, and there's really low downside risk. So even if they do something that wrecks the entire firm, all they get is a severance package, which could be pretty lucrative. Was pretty lucrative for their CEO. Um, so if we look at it from their perspective, okay, you know, these poor traders, you know, if, if I don't sell any more CDSs, my uh, lifetime expected earnings at the firm are only like $100 million. Um, you know, I don't know how anybody could live with only $100 million. Um, but, but if they go and sell more, um, well, what's the worst thing that can happen? Well, worst thing that can happen is I get canned and I get my severance package and I only make $50 million. But the best thing that happens is I sort of double my earnings. I go up to $200 million, which some of them could have. Um, wow, if, if you do this analysis, you, from, the, from the trader's perspective, sell shares. I don't have any, I have very low downside. I don't have the same kind of downside as the firm. So there's a, there's a misalignment of the incentives. And the objective for these, these people is completely different from the 
the objective for the shareholders. Um, but the firm was set up in a way to reward these people um, as opposed to thinking about what's happening or what might happen to the shareholders. So, so having more sophisticated tools, I don't think, would have helped in this case. All right, let's look at, I'll try to go through these others. Uh, a little more quickly. Um, Deepwater Horizon. Um, okay, maybe this one was also a mistake. There are a lot of potential causes. Um, you know, the fact that it was in much deeper water than, than they had experience with. Um, what I'm going to focus on is just one, one part, just one, one little risk um, measure that they could have implemented. And that was a, a, an additional blowout preventer. So they had these blowout preventers, these so-called blind shear rams, um, that were installed to, if, if anything is happening, if they start to have a leak, you're supposed to shear up the pipe, seal it over, and that's it. No more stuff. Um, but of course, it failed. The one that they had failed, the, the rest is history. Um, Okay, so let's look at them. Let's take a look. Well, let me see. Can I, am I going to put in one of these blow preventers or two? Um, what do they cost? Like a million dollars, okay? Well, it's not another, another million dollars that I'd have to come up with. A little bit uh, more involved decision tree here. Um, looking at the decision of should I go with one or should I go with two, and that million dollars just protects me against the event of um, first a leak and then um, a complete uh, Still, um, well, first I have the leak, leak probability, I don't know what it was, but let's say because they were in unknown waters, it was 110. I'm not saying they didn't know that. They might have known that. If, in fact, they probably should have known that. And let's say the, the chance that um, that the blow-up preventer doesn't work, maybe that, that they're not all that reliable, especially in this kind of situation, so maybe that was 110 as well. Um, so there, there was a reasonable chance that something like this could have happened, and I think a lot of people probably know about that. Um, so if you look about it from the perspective of, should I have spent that extra million dollars to save a little bit of a chance of losing $40 billion as it's forecast to be paid? Um, should I have done that? Yeah. If you look at it from the B3 perspective, it makes total sense. They should, they should have done this absolutely. Um, so it, it looks like they... It should have been a no-brainer for anybody that does any kind of analysis. Put in the two, two blow-up preventers. It only costs another million dollars. Um, maybe they just maybe they got the probabilities wrong. Maybe they're looking at it from a different different way. What what was going on? Well, again, think about it from the management's perspective. Again, how was management compensated? Management was compensated by getting that platform online as quickly as possible with bonus compensation again. Not necessarily aligned with shareholders, but aligned with how quickly they could get that up. So it wasn't just a million dollars. It was, oh, well, yeah, another blow-up friend. That's going to delay things a little bit. That means my bonus is going to kick in as fast. Um, let's look at it from their perspective. Okay. Same sort of story. If I look at it from their perspective, what the numbers that I made up here, um, uh, but if I look at it from their perspective, and I, these, these numbers are ominously close to uh, Tony Hayward's payout. Oh, wow. That's um, uh, uh, so, if you look at it from, let's say, someone like that's uh, perspective, boy, I'm not sure I would have done the, the extra million dollars and maybe three months delay in, in terms of operation. Um, I'm not sure that there wasn't really incentive there for the decisions that were made. That is, all the same analysis, you come up with the same, same decision every time. Um, Okay, so again, what's the problem? The, the executives' losses were limited on the downstream. Big severance package. Um, early completion had a big reward. Bonus compensation tied to, to coming up with an improvement in operation as quickly as possible. So even with the best knowledge of probabilities, um, the decisions might have just been the same. Okay, I'm going to try this. A of Yachtel, I do. Um, volcano. <laughs> uh, so, what, did, what happened here? Alright, so we've got this volcano um, that erupts, um, spills all this action in the sky. Um, European airspace is closed for six days. And then other airports have been for a while. Um, certainly, the estimate cost me for the airline industry around $2 billion just, just in that. Um, pretty big losses um, for some big companies. Um, so if we look at the EU Transport Commission, did they act, act properly? 
Were they just testing what these roots are? Um, you know, how many planes have gone down due to volcanic gas? Um, none that anyone's aware of. Um, so, uh, you know, maybe those probabilities were pretty low, um, but how are they going about assessing? Well, if we think about it in terms of, you know, how likely it was, for example, for a plane to actually be forced down because uh, of ash. Um, and it's pretty unlikely. I put it in one in a thousand with the hostility here, and I just made up some numbers for what might be the cause of that. Um, but if you look at it from that perspective, it doesn't seem like, you know, you'd, you'd have to have, if you just look at it this way, you'd have to have a pretty big probability for that ash to actually impact the plane um, in order to come up with a decision that you'd want to close your airspace with this amount of time. Um, so it looks like that was, a, it looks like a bad decision. It looks like they, they, they should not have uh, come up with, um, I guess that's maybe a slight loss there. Okay, now, if you look at it from the perspective of the Transport Commission, Transport Commissions across the, the EU, um, um, it makes a lot more sense. Because you think about, if there's any probability that something happens bad, what's going to happen to them? They're going to be looking for a job. Um, so, so let's go down, you know, a little more realistic with their uh, lifetime earnings. Let's go down their lifetime earnings around $2 million. Well, they don't want to be out of that $2 million for any chance. So even if, even if the expected value with whatever risk they put in is anything negative, they're going to say, close it down. So if you look at it from the perspective of the people who are actually making the decision, it makes perfect sense. Um, not knowing what these probabilities are, there's no need for them to even investigate. There's no need for them to think, oh, maybe I should figure out what the probability is that the ash is actually going to cause a disruption of flights. Um, there's no need for them to look at that. They know the probability is greater than zero, um, and that's all they need to know. They, there's no need for them to investigate. This, this would have been their decision in that way. Um, so the problem is, if, if you look at it from the perspective of, you know, let's think about all the firms that operate, in particular the firms that, whose businesses depend on uh, going into the air and transporting people from one place to another, um, if you focus on that, you come up with a very different decision from it focusing on the people who actually made, uh, made the decision here. So again, a misalignment of incentives um, can lead to very different results. So even if we had all of our OR tools available, um, it wouldn't necessarily have made any difference in the outcome, um, given the way uh, those incentives were, were aligned. Okay, so what, what are we to do? Um, what, I think, what I think we have to do, and, you know, as I say, I, I keep on learning this lesson over and over again. I just gave you like these, those first two examples, but I, you know, I, you, anybody who does practice uh, knows that this happens all the time. Like, why aren't you implementing the thing that I think you ought to implement because it's going to save you a lot of money or it's going to make a lot of money for you. Um, but you have to think about, we're, we're usually thinking about the firm perspective or the shareholder's perspective, and maybe that's not the same thing as the government's perspective. Maybe that's not the same thing as the individual who is tasked with making that decision. So, so I don't think we should try to change the, to make sure that you know, we hire people that are totally non-self-interested because I don't think, unfortunately, that those humans exist. Maybe if we went to another planet, we could find some. But I think here, that's not going to happen. Um, so I, what I think we have to do is work on how we construct systems that align incentives at the very beginning. Now, unfortunately, I think that makes, well, first, unfortunately, or, or fortunately, I think that makes problems a lot more complex, um, which is good because that means we should have jobs for a while. Um, but um, yeah, I think, it, and it's, it's a fuller mechanism of design, the kind of things that Khan just talked about. Um, but I think it's, it's a different thing because it's actually sort of dynamic in nature. All these problems are dynamic. You don't know when they're going to actually arise. So you have to set up your incentive systems in such a way that, that um, no matter what sort of happens as, as you go through um, with some, some kind of planning, um, that the right kinds of decisions get made. Um, so what we need to do is combine the incentive decisions as well as our analysis of alternatives for, for what's best for the organization, which is the way we usually look at things. So but I'll just take this AIG as a little example. But suppose we align the compensation with the effect on the shareholders. Okay, now it's, it's going to be really hard because we, in order to get people to actually work, um, we're going to have to pay them some wage all the time, right? So we can't necessarily just give them equity. Um, people tried that in the uh, dot-com boom, um, and, you know, unfortunately that doesn't really work. Um, so we, we can't just, just give people equity. Um, what we can do is do some things like delaying compensation until outcomes are known, um, or in, 
involving some kind of a clawback provision. That is, well, you know, I'm going to give you this $50 million bonus now, um, but, you know, if things go south, that is, if, if you're actually doing something that we discover is not in the best interest of the shareholders, which I'm responsible for, um, if it's not in the best interest of the shareholders, we're going to have to take some of that back. Um, so but if I had something like that here, it would, it would not have taken all that much um, in the AIG case. Right? These, are, these are guys who are making like $50 million a year. Um, you know, believe it or not. Um, that's that's the, the compensation schemes that they had. Um, so all you had to do was say, well, you know, we're going to take, take some of that back. In this case, maybe $10 million, but the numbers again, the numbers that I made up. But $10 million would have been enough to, make, to provide an incentive such that they would have held off on some of those CDSs and they'd be gritting their teeth because they'd be losing out on um, potential bonuses, but make the bonuses less, put in some clawback provision, and you can get back to what the first best decision should have been. The same type of thing can be applied um, to the BP story, um, aligning with the value of the project, um, so that the compensation is not just based on when does that well come online and then we'll give you a bonus, but more in terms of how is this project going to pan out over time. Now we're only going to find out how it pans out over time uh, by delaying compensation. So deferring compensation is another way that we can do that. I think it's harder in that corporate setting, maybe the, a lot of the compensation is not as much as in terms of bonus as, as it is in, um, in the AIG setting, um, but you, know, you might also involve some kind of clawback. Maybe you can check on what unreasonable risk they might have taken. Um, in the EU trade program, it does not take very much. There just has to be a little bit of incentive in there for whoever is making those decisions, whether it's the EU transport commissioner or the commissioners in the individual countries. Um, there just needs to be a little bit of incentive, a little bit of incentive for them to ignore, to, to take into consideration the size of probability, or to even be interested in finding out how likely that risk was. What was the actual risk that was associated with that? Um, I think there are a lot of this, a lot of cases where this happens. Just th things that I think about, you know, do, do the ordering decisions that managers make or the purchasing decisions that managers make are they always being the best interest of the firm? Now, this, this, this maybe is more common for us to think about, um, but those are things I think we have to recognize as we build our models. Um, I think there are a lot of inefficiencies, whether in governments or hospitals um, that um, maybe are, are somewhat deliberate. That is, the efficiency, the inefficiency is in there because of the payment system or because of the reward system that is set up in that organization. And it's endemic. It's not something like, it, this is an incredibly frustrating thing for us to do, is to try to improve efficiency when they're trying to do absolutely the opposite. I don't want people coming in my like, I don't want them to stay out. I'm going to make it as inefficient as possible. I don't want to drive people away uh, because I don't make money on them. Besides, they, all they do is they have either government insurance or no insurance. That's no good for me. Um, so I think, you know, we have to recognize there are a lot of incentives that are there that are absolutely the opposite of the kinds of things we do. Um, and I think there's, there's a number of reasons for why people make risky investment decisions, often based on compensation schemes, um, and why other investment decisions might not be taken, again, based on the opposite kind of an incentive scheme. Um, I'll talk about um, AIG a little bit here. You know, if, if you think about other kinds of risk management techniques, the, the way it's set up right now, if you look at the Basel uh, systems for the way banks should be operated, the risk management is allocated to economic capital. So that's how much money you set aside. That's like the money you set aside to cover possible losses. So if you just make sure that people set aside the right amount of money to cover possible losses, then everything should be fine. We shouldn't have our risk management taken care of. Um, that's, in, in AIG's case, you know, capital that, that would be there to recover um, losses, um, is that really effective? Would that have been effective in their case? No, it was already there. They had that collateral. It wasn't the, the, the amount of the collateral. It wasn't the amount of the collateral that they were required to carry. It was the fact that they, the collateral changed. So if the economic capital changes, and it can happen a lot in a short amount of time, then that's not really going to... Having 
more economic capital is not going to work. Either it's going to cost way more than it should, or um, it's it's just not going to be effective because we're not going to be able to raise it rapidly enough. We're going to send prices down. Um, and the fact that we had that economic capital that we had to come up with very, very quickly is what led to having prices go down so fast. So just using economic capital as a, as a risk mechanism is really not something uh, that can be effective. So what we need is some kind of modification of the payoff, as I, as I showed in that decision tree, um, that ends up making some kind of individual rationality for the people who are making decisions within the firm. It's got to be incentive compatible in the sense that you still have to attract them to work for you. They, it has to be more than whatever their outside alternative is. Um, and we have to design payoffs to make those incentives effective. This is just a way to look at it, um, just so that I have at least one equation somewhere in my talk. Um, so, uh, you know, if, if you take the old paradigm of choosing economic capital, choose this capital in such a way that you cover your risk, whatever you do, you know, you can analyze that risk measure and come up with all kinds of risk measures. You can analyze that to death. Um, that system is just not going to hack it in terms of actual risk management um, when there are individuals who can take the kinds of bets um, that were made um, at AIG. Instead, what we need is design around choosing payoffs in such a way. So instead of, instead of thinking about what, what economic capital should we have, it should be about what payoffs we're going to make um, to the people who are actually doing the decisions or making the decisions in such a way that, for one thing, it's individually rational for them, that is, that they get the best that they possibly could, um, and it's also it's incompatible, that is, that, they're, that it's better than whatever their outside alternative is. Now, I think this, this is sort of a shift, at least a shift from the way that I'm, I'm usually used to looking at things, in terms of a single objective, a dynamic optimization model, um, that, that you saw, you just said, you know, I, I know that I want to make as much money as possible for the firm, and they must all want to do that as well, so that's the way I'm going to, to design this, this system for them. Um, instead, think about, think about those models more like they are mechanism designs. Think about it in terms of perspective of the person who actually has to implement what it is that you're providing to that organization. Um, and think about that when you go about um, solving your models. Now these are more complex, you know, that's those, those mechanisms design. This is not the sort of standard mechanism design where it's a one-shot deal I try to reveal um, what their preferences are. No, no, this is, um, this is something that has to be dynamic, has to, be, has to work over time. So I think there's a lot of challenges in that. I think there are computational challenges. That I, I still stumble um, just being able to do the very first thing, dynamic stochastic optimization. Um, those problems are already hard. These problems are, are way harder than that. Um, so hopefully that means it will work for a long, long time. Um, but we, you have to ensure when you do this uh, that everybody, well, in this case, uh, I'm saying that everybody's individually rational, but individually rational even with behavioral components, thinking about it in terms of, you know, maybe they aren't making what uh, we prototypically call individually rational decisions, but I think they actually make rational decisions on their own, own behalf, uh, but maybe not, not the same way that, that we typically think about it. Um, but also it has to be something that will still keep the best people out of the firm. We still don't want the firm to, to lose its best people. Um, and also think about whether it's important, whether these are things that we can actually implement. Um, um, so, um, so what does that mean? We have a change of view. If systems do not work as we feel they should, then we have to go and think about it. maybe we're not modeling the right objective for the decision maker. I think we can use OR to find that objective, find ways in which we can make decision makers choose the right thing that's in their best interest as well as in the best interest of the organization that they're supposed to represent and that we're, we think is our client. Um, and once we understand our objectives, then I think we can design policies that align with overall goals. Okay, so, um, to conclude, I think the, the recent crises and the reactions to them may not have been examples of an improper analysis. It, it could have been that they did all the right things that in terms of looking at problems, assessing probabilities, assessing payoffs, assessing outcomes. Um, they may have been perfectly rational. Perfectly rational, but also self-interested. And that's not, I mean, that's the way we are. We're human. That's the way we act. We act in our own self-interest. I think we need to model such behavior, but also design better systems to make that behavior align with the overall goal 
roles of the firm or society or the government that we're working for. Um, we need to change and consider all the agent reactions um, that are required. That's going to require better models, analysis, implementation, and continuous learning, learning and feedback that we build into those models. Um, so we can all be contribute to this. Um, we can use ORMS to avoid the next great crisis. At least, I hope, maybe we won't see it. Um, and to recover more quickly, even if even if one happens, like uh, like the volcano. Okay. Well, thank you very much, and uh, I want to well thank you for your attention. Maybe, uh,